Um, so thank you for ki Steve's kind introduction. Um, I don't have to repeat what I do or what I've done previously, um, but I just want to say it's been a wonderful opportunity for TEXA um, through the Commission to develop this toolkit. And I wanted to um, acknowledge all the feedback that I, and input that I had from my colleagues across the sector who have given me lots of extra detail beyond my own experience that is included in this. Um, so just to set the scene for today, I'm going to give you an overview of the toolkit, which I'm hoping will be online later today. Oh, yep, I've just got the nod. It will be online later today, so that's good. Um, I'll set the scene, tell you what it's all about, and then I'll give you an overview of the toolkit. Okay. Okay, so it's very helpful being on at a conference later in the day when lots of people have already said lots and lots of things about everything that I'm prepared to say. So you're very well primed to um, hear about it again. So this toolkit is grounded in the assurance of being in the integrity of the higher education award and should be seen equally to support students and providers, and particularly pri private providers who are new to T&E. So the sector at large has a great opportunity to recover from the COVID pandemic by offering its awards across different delivery modes and into new and emerging markets. The opportunity should take advantage of the changes in delivery approaches that were necessary during the COVID lockdowns and to be of great benefit both to students and institutions. But this opportunity needs to be balanced with the risks that are innate to offering awards offshore to ensure the integrity of the Australian higher ed sector and the awards. So the toolkit is primed to enhance institutions' understanding of those risks and how to manage them. So delivery of the Higher Education Award offshore will only increase over the coming years and the variety of delivery models will respond to market demand and evolving technologies. So the toolkit is designed to support staff in assuring the integrity of those awards alongside providing a quality experience for all students. So this slide is just showing you a high level, the high level considerations of risks and challenges. So this is what you've heard about today already ad nauseum. Um, but I just wanted to point out, because they're very, very important. So you can see here the flow of how a student moves through any type of T&E and, and how an institution should follow that student. So admissions practices, RPL, how does it apply offshore? Student induction and ongoing pastoral care and academic support, student safety and wellbeing, we hear about them a lot, but think about how you might ensure that this is happening at a partner on the other side of the world. How do you make sure that those on induction, wellbeing services apply to those students? And how different are they to what a student looks like in Australia? Cyber security, absolutely. How do you make sure that Australian laws for privacy apply equally with in-country laws around data, data transfer between Australia and wherever you're delivering offshore. Award recognition in country, again, something that we're going to encounter separately, differently, every time you're looking at a different partner. Assessment and vigilation, academic integrity, learner authentic, authentic, authentication, sorry. How do we know that the student in the room online is actually the student who's enrolled? And the intersection of offshore and Australian laws. The point there on contracts is a little bit separate to how you deal with students, but it's equally as important, and I'll step this through a little bit more. So when I was thinking about how I'd structure this toolkit, the natural thing that came to mind for me was life cycle. So what this toolkit sets out is a life cycle of T&E. It takes the reader or the user through the key phases of T&E delivery and can be applied to any model of T&E, be it a branch campus, or any contract arrangement, such as a third party. And it is useful in this scenario to think about third party delivery, just because it allows us to set it out a little bit in more detail. So the information in the toolkit is presented in a way that can be utilised by all higher ed institutions, be they big, small, private, public, um, and by staff across the university's operations. It's not, it's not just for quality assurance staff, it's not just for academics. So you can pick it up all, any, at any point throughout that cycle. So for those of you who work with the standards framework like I do, you can see easily that this life cycle mirrors the life cycle that's embedded in the higher ed standards framework. So if you think about it in that way, you can apply what the toolkit presents and the issues and the steps throughout T&E delivery with what you would see in the higher ed standards framework. So if you've got a question about what the standards mean or you've got a question about what you need to do with your T&E, 
they complement each other really closely. So I don't want to read it out to you, but you can see the, the life cycle here. Pretty simply, it runs you through the delivery of any partnership, and then you just keep on going, and then you just keep on going round. I can't emphasise enough that T&E is complicated, it's costly, and it's always going to be more involved than you first imagined. I'm sure that those of you who have experience in that would know that already. Uh, okay, excuse me. So just a, a quick slide on the structure. The toolkit includes some icons and checklists to guide you through. You can see the light glow pretty obviously is like a best practice tip. And the warning sign identifies where there may be a lead indicator of risk that's evident or emerging. And there's lots and lots of checklists which are useful for people. You can pull out a page and make sure that you've got every step along the way. So, and to the right, this is a sample page on what the, um, the life cycle looks like in the toolkit. And I've pulled it out because it's the one page, it's the one step that has all of the icons that you might like to see. So you can see, so stakeholder management is completely critical and you need to pick, like it's the most, like, they're all equally important, but this is the one that you return to again and again. Best practice, think about staff turnover. You can't induct, induct staff once because, as you would know from even your home institutions, staff move. They're constantly moving in and out. They might be changing roles. You can't assume that a partner would always induct a new staff member to the same standard that you've done that. So that's the best practice. Um, oh, actually, that's a warning. Um, yeah, they're kind of the same. So you can see there that the best practice and the, the staff turnover. I'll just... So, supporting successful t and arrangements. This is presented in the toolkit as a final consideration, but I've put it up here as an ongoing consideration. So the three top things to know. With t and as I've mentioned, never underestimate how much work is required to manage a successful partnership. t and is an ongoing concern. Always work and think in terms of being in a partnership and use that in the language and approach. Stay in close contact and don't imagine that the partner ever has everything completely under control. And I think the main thing to remind ourselves is that the institution that's registered with TechSite is always the one who has core responsibility for the delivery. Even if you've got a third party arrangement between yourself and a partner on the other side of the world or even close by, you can't forget that the, registered, the, reg, the institution registered with TechSite remains accountable. It's very, very easy for a risk at the partner to become a very big problem for the home campus. The diagram to the right shows a way that you can manage this quite effectively. So a partnership governance framework at the institutional level can support all aspects of an arrangement. So you can obviously tailor this to the size and the scope. A joint management committee guides the contract through its life cycle. It should have the senior leaders and set the strategy, make sure risks are being managed appropriately, set KPIs, all the key contract material. Operational committees meets more regularly, make sure that the, you know, the wheels are rolling. Service delivery groups, there'll be lots of service delivery groups in terms of the different aspects of, the, of what the partnership involves, and then the academic governance arrangements. It's through talking with my colleagues across the sector, really easy ways of bringing on board a partner is to include them in boards of studies, boards of examiners, get them on membership of committees, allow partner staff to be involved in those processes and imagine that they are a staff member just like any other person at the home campus. So I hope that's my short presentation this afternoon. I hope that gives you a good flavour of what the Teenage Toolkit will provide and I welcome any questions. That's yours. Um, so the, um, the note says that the uh, toolkit is available on, on the website, which is uh, great to know. Uh, many traps for young players in T&E. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea how many T&E students there are at the moment? I don't think we do. Do we text the people with all the data? I, don't, I think we need to have a, probably a much better idea of how many providers have T&E contracts and T&E partnerships available. 
I'm going to answer that question. And many of them uh, exist. Mm -hmm. It's true. Okay, floor is yours. Who's going to ask a question? Yes. Excellent. As a, just a sec. Just a sec. Yes, I think in one of your diagrams you had a review phase, mm -hmm. so I, which is really, really important in terms of quality assurance of CNE partnerships. So what, what's your sense of what a, a good review, a, 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 a good practice looks like in a review phase? Well, I think there's a couple of ways that you could do it. One of the points that I make is that um, you don't need to make, wait for a review cycle to come upon you, and review should be an ongoing part of the partnership. I don't think you need to wait for a seven-year cycle, like with your registration with Texel, you wouldn't wait a seven, year, a three-year term for a contract. I think if you're addressing matters as they go and making changes along the way, when a contract renewal comes up, you know you kind of you've got that narrative with a partner already underway. There are no surprises. I think that's probably another best practice tip to always make sure that you've got a good dialogue with your partner to ensure that nothing emerges at the end of a contract period that's significant enough to cause major issues. So I think review is an ongoing practice. It doesn't necessarily need to be called that, but I think you need to be maintaining constantly the quality of the delivery. Um, I, there's a question down the back, but before we get to that, uh, one of the, uh, in my experience, one of the key issues is to keep close to each other along the path and not have surprises at the end, because that that will make the renewal almost an impossible uh, outcome. So you need to know what's happening along the path and you need to work with each other as true partners to make it uh, a truly uh, successful venture. Question. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Sam. Um, the, I actually missed the very start of it, so if you covered this, apologies. Um, how do you resolve tensions, if not outright contradictions, between the higher education standards framework requirements and regulatory requirements in the, um, the other jurisdiction? Well, ideally that would be raised as you do, in the due diligence exercise that you do before you sign a contract. Um, so you'd be wanting to scope that out pretty carefully before you sign up to any contract in a new jurisdiction. Very, very difficult, I guess, to be balancing commercial interests with how far you can stretch the standards requirements. Obviously, you're going to have new and additional requirements in country, but you, the higher ed standards framework is paramount in terms of delivering the Australian awards. So there are ongoing risks to manage. But if you can't find a way, then you can't find a way. But these are the things that, that and the toolkit sets out a very long exercise in due diligence and getting ahead of in-country requirements, in-country legislation how you can compete with the, you know, complement the Australian system. So it's a good question, Ian. Uh, excellent question. Uh, before someone asks the next one, there's one down the front here. Uh, there's a question online, Sam. What is the website where the TNA toolkit is available? <laughs> well, it's a Texa website, um, and I imagine that there'll be a link on the front page, and then it will live in the resources section, I'm imagining. Uh, anyone from Texa in the room oh, who knows the in. answer? Yes, it'll be on there. Stay now. Okay, stay now. It's on the front page. Downloaded it. Had a quick <laughs> squeeze. So, uh, um, uh, Question. Just, mistake on page ten. No, I'm just joking. No. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Thanks. Congratulations on the toolkit. It looks really, really good. Um, um, in your presentation and through the toolkit, it's, it's sort of positions T&E is synonymous with partnership, and I just wanted to get a sense as to whether or not. Um, the, the toolkit, or, or uh, particularly Monash, um, uh, are you doing T and E that is independent of partnerships and is just sort of standalone, kind of offshore? Um, uh, um, are there particular issues uh, associated with going it alone rather than in partnership, which um, the, the toolkit uh, addresses, or, or, or that we need to be aware of? Just to be clear, this is separate to my work at Monash, and I'm just trying to clarify the question. So, do you mean? Running a branch campus, for example, or managing work, or managing TNA offshore in your own right. Um, so the toolkit acknowledges both. I think primarily the toolkits to support new and emerging markets and new players into TNA. 
um, it sets out lots of information, I guess, that you would work through if you were wondering if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, but if, for, for well-established providers, I think the risks are not any different and the risks are the same. The way of approaching t &E in a branch campus model, for example, are absolutely the same. I think it's just the way that you apply your methodology to the advice that it, as it's given. So running a branch campus offshore, very difficult. Establishing branch campuses offshore, very difficult. But the principles and I guess the rigour and the questions that you ask are very much the same. Thank you. So there's many uh, traps for young players in this uh, area, not just academic, but also operational. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, building a new building on the Vietnam campus of RMIT had to get 17 different organisations to regulators to approve that development. So you are dealing with a different framework altogether. And that's just Vietnam. Next question. You've run them dry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, uh, starting a campus in Indonesia, um, that must have been uh, quite a challenging task. Uh, getting the legislation passed in the first place must have been a, uh, a challenging task. Uh, what's the time frame it, uh, does it take to, to actually get a T&E up and going? Well, the thing that we've forgotten quite quickly is that we established Indonesia during COVID, which is, when I reflect on it, quite a feat because we did it all via Zoom, all in country, all across um, lockdown, really, um, which is, I think the decision to push through with the establishment was the, the right one because now we're quite well established in Indonesia. But the, I guess the legislative landscape there is changing still. The regulatory framework is emerging. Hmm. So um, we are getting ahead of that as much as we can to make sure that Monash can, well, the Australian sector can shape the emerging higher ed sector in Indonesia in a way that supports quality delivery. New partners coming in rather than being, you know, we entered a very, very bare landscape and we've mm. been able to steer it through taking the system that we have and influencing one offshore. Did it take one month, one year, oh, ten frame. years? Well, I guess when's ever anything really finished? Um, <laughs> from start to finish, I think it was 18 months. Uh, yeah, I think from 2019 to middle of 2021 when we started delivering awards. But I don't think it was about take five years yard. before that. <laughs> I think it was a long time before that too. I don't think I'd ever take a measure on time. No. So if you're going to be in this game, you need, you need to be prepared for a long stint and lots of energy. And you need to get to know the, the country and the way it works as well. Uh, because every country has different uh, norms of uh, commercial and academic activity, uh, an important element. And it's in, in, in uh, the toolkit as well. Another question. We've got time for one or two more. Remember, you can't go out the door if you <laughs> haven't asked a question. Someone's escaping already. <laughs> You, um, one of the challenges is getting uh, academic standards at the same level as, uh, as you've got locally because mm -hmm. you're uh, giving out Australian uh, degrees. How do you ensure that, that the staff who are providing the, the teaching and learning experience are at the same level as, as at back at home? I think the, the JMC model, the committee model that's presented is a very, very, is an easy way of setting it out. I think, and I don't want to repeat myself in terms of making sure that you stay in contact with your partner and that you manage your staff induction, but there's also, in addition to those things, it's reporting and making sure that you have good data sets coming out of your courses, running through the main institution academic governance arrangements, looking for those lead indicators in terms of student outcomes, risk, compliance, all the normal quality assurance markers, they will be the key indications of issues or they'll tell you where in a particular delivery you need to focus your attention. Okay. 
No. Any questions? Yep. Okay. Last question. Hi, Sam. Robin Phillips. I'm just interested to know about the numbers of onshore student flows from offshore campuses and what percentage of students actually come onshore after being in an onshore uh, full branch campus model? That's not necessarily a question that I can answer in terms of data. Um, a lot of the, the our, so Australian branch campuses are established for the students to stay, to study there from end to end, rather than to, uh, to move campus and articulate. But I do know that a lot of institutions allow seamless enrolment across locations. But in terms of t and articulation arrangements, I think that's a little bit different in terms of institutions that have arrangements offshore for two plus two modes of t &E and those types of arrangements. Um, the toolkit sets out, a, a, I guess, the known range of t &E arrangements that we have. Articulation, joint awards, double degrees. There's lots of different types and a few different labels that sound very similar. But the, there is information on that provided as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam, for thank uh, the thank presentation. And please, please thank Sam for the toolkit as well. Uh, she put a huge amount of work into it. Well done. Mm -hmm.